Once again, a quick uh, recap. Uh, the Lord of Fjords MGTOW database has been generous enough to lend me his channel, give me direct access for spontaneous uploads. And this is off the cuff, but I do want to go into some depth and detail on this very important topic. And because of that, I didn't want to be limited to 15 minutes. So if you've come here uh, spontaneously, uh, simply because you're subscribed to MGTOW database, this is in fact Stardusk. And uh, otherwise, you probably have seen my little announcement video guiding you to this channel. And for spontaneous longer than 15 minute uploads, I think MGTOW database is going to be the place where I upload because I have spontaneous access for really long scripted videos like the one that seems to be going on forever that I never really get around to continuing. Likely that cynical cynicism, uh, but that remains to be seen. However, however, let's move on to the topic at hand. What I want to talk about in this video is the, the concept, uh, biological precedence. What is meant by biological precedence? Um, this was in part spurred on by, I'm not going to name his name, a defeat the left, uh, Marx, Engels, and Hegel are the great three-headed Satan, blah, blah, blah kind of guy who uh, posted some uh, gibberish on my most recent video. So before moving on, however, to the concept of biological precedence and what I mean by that, I want to talk about what you see here, what Einstein is talking about, the difference between knowledge and understanding. There is a difference between knowing something and understanding it. The two are often complementary, and knowledge implies understanding, but it doesn't necessitate understanding. You can say, I can literally say, uh, E equals mc squared, that doesn't mean I have understanding of that. Uh, that, that see, that's the distinction. I, Stardust can say uh, English F is a voiceless labiodental fricative. German CH, when preceded by certain vowels, is a voiceless velar fricative and preceded by other vowels in, in a different consonantal environment is a uh, palatal fricative, voice palatal fricative. Now, th that's just me spouting out f uh, facts. However, however, I could go further on and say, but Stardust also understands why English F, for example, is a voiceless labiodental fricative, because our Stardust has some uh, knowledge and understanding of articulatory phonetics. So English F is that we call English F a voiceless labiodental fricative because of the positioning of the tongue near the lips, but also near uh, the back of the teeth. And that's why we call it. And it's, of course, uh, a voiceless because of the aspiration, if you will, uh, when you're speaking that consonant, pronouncing that consonant, you'll feel a puff of air. That would be a layman's explanation. That's why we call it a voiceless labiodental fricative. I understand it and I know it. That's the distinction between understanding and knowing. And like I said, they can be complementary or they can not be. It's easy just to know something. If I, I could say that uh, you know, Con uh, Constantinople was, and I'm doing this totally off my head, uh, conquered by the, the Ottomans in 1452. I believe that's the right date, or 53, one of the two. I also know somewhat of the background behind that. Uh, I mean, the Byzantine Empire had been shrinking for centuries, uh, and uh, the the Ottomans had uh, been wearing away at it for centuries. But you know, simply spouting out dates in itself doesn't really mean very much. So yeah, there's a distinction between understanding and and knowing. And to, to understand something, however, to understand something that that does necessitate and require uh, knowledge. Of it, but like I said, they're not uh, they're not necessarily directly linked to each other. And why am I talking about the distinction between knowledge and understanding? Well, because in my assessment, the the people who rant on about communism and Marxism and cultural Marxism and Hegel and Engels and uh, uh, dialectical materialism and so on and so forth, I mean, it's it's all great. But these are people claiming to know something. They rarely assert their understanding. Now, in addition, as you can see, Einstein 
is implying, or literally saying, that to understand something is to understand, to apprehend its most basic components, the simplest parts. That's how science works, after all. You start with the building blocks and you move beyond that. You build upon those building blocks. Things become more complex as time goes on. This is how biological organisms work. This is how life, which is a biological organism, works. Life on planet Earth started approximately 3.5 billion years ago uh, with single-celled organisms. Extremely simple. Extremely simple. I mean, uh, there's an example for of, of this, for example, um, of uh, a kind of uh, bacteria that can survive uh, subpolar uh, climates, i.e., ice age temperatures, with with almost nothing. It's a form of life, but it's extremely and 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 it survived likely uh, all of the various extinction events that have been ongoing. I think we're in, we're in the sixth one. We're in the Holocene right now, and yeah, it survives. It, but it's incredibly simple. I mean, this is this is as simple as an organism as you can get, and it get it becomes more complicated over time. You know, from single cell, we go to multiple, multiple cell. Then we eventually we go to more advanced marine life. Marine life leaves land, uh, leaves sea, the sea moves onto land, and so on and so forth. Eventually, we get to uh, mammalian creatures and so on and so forth and eventually eventually we get to homo sapiens you see simple to complex however what what uh, the, uh, the three-headed Satan proponents as I like to call them claim is it's it's really complex it's it's all complex there, there's no simple aspect to it you have to you have to you have to know that Marx, Engels, and Hegel, they, they orchestrated this, and feminism is completely based on communism, social Marxism. See, what people fail to realize, I've never denied the the uh, rassemblement, this, the relationship between uh, Marxism and feminism. However, it is imperative for us to always pose the question, what is it about a particular political ideology that makes it so attractive to a particular group of people? And as, as I like to make the distinction between capital F and lowercase f feminists, indeed, not every woman, in fact, very few women these days are capital F feminists, but all, many, many women, a majority of women are lowercase f in, in the sense that they're willing, very willing, and enjoy uh, accepting the benefits of, of a large state, of, uh, of essentially a socialist form of government, and uh, like I said, I, I don't believe the United States is a socialist system completely. It's a giant hodgepodge mixture. It always has been. But in this case, of welfare, WIC, and benefits, and maternity leave, they, they enjoy that. What is it about female nature that makes it so vulnerable, if you want to use that word, to particular version, stra strains of Marxism? No? Well, i.e. feminism. Well... Some people know, but they don't want to dig further with the question. They say, well, women are naturally more inclined towards collectivist thinking. Yeah, that's true. Women, and then they have to dig deeper and deeper. Women naturally seek out, naturally seek out uh, protection and provision at all costs. And women think of them, themselves as individuals and other women as extensions of themselves, but they don't, and they're not long-time planners in the sense of, what are the consequences of, of looking out for my own well-being well -being at the expense of others? They don't think along those lines. And the particular iteration we see uh, in feminism, and the kind of feminism that manifests, particularly in second wave and onward, is in large measure very appealing to that aspect of female nature. And this is what I mean by biological precedence. So I mentioned just prior, uh, biological life has been around for, in some shape or form, roughly 3.5 billion years. If we fast forward to Homo sapiens, uh, roughly 200,000 years. Now, 
to the best of my knowledge, the first manifestation of what could be called culture was found in a South African cave with cave paintings, the first painting uh, for, form of artwork uh, ever found in Homo sapiens, approximately 70, between 70 and 60,000 years ago. And usually anthropologists and archaeologists associate any manifestation of art with you know, thought processes and we call it even culture. So here we have a culture 70,000 years ago, and that's being generous. Between that, the gap between that and 3.5 billion years ago, pretty immense. Before we move on to anything even political, and you know it's possible that something existed prior to Sumerian civilization, but the Sumerian city-state, approximately 6,000 years ago, a little, little more, a little less, depending on which stage it's at, in Mesopotamia, in the Fertile Crescent, well, that's a even that's a huge gap too, you know, give or take, uh, give or take. 50, 60, 65, 55, 54,000 years. So that's a huge gap before we even have anything we could call a city-state, anything we could even call resembling civilization. That's a big gap. That's a very large gap. And, and prior to these homo sapiens in South Africa uh, painting things indicating that that's some form of culture and prior to the Sumerian city-state uh, roughly 6,000 years ago what was going on the whole time well there was a very simple game of survival and reproduction the bi basic biological um, premises for life and that has been ongoing since the the inception of life since life occurred on planet earth and to deny that this incredibly long trek that life has been on of very simple, once again, we're going back to the simple basic building blocks, building blocks of life, the, the formula, if you will, of survival, reproduce, raise young long enough so that young can reproduce and essentially gene replication. That's been ongoing since, yes, the, the beginning, the very beginning. And when culture came about, and more importantly, when a form of civilization came about, this was, I would argue, indisputably, the building block behind all form, cultural formations and all formations of civilization, legal structure, societal structure, social strata, and so on and so forth. They all somehow... All these seemingly differing things, these differing aspects, culturally speaking, structurally speaking, socially speaking, in terms of the totality of civilization, they will all fall within the purview of biological precedents because those precedents have been the determining factors for not just human life, all biological life, and that's a bit redundant since bios is life, on planet Earth. To say that there's no relationship between that, and some do claim, some uh, many people, uh, most recently this woman Bayinia, who I'm, actually, I'm, whom I've never been familiar with prior to her rant about um, Barbarossa and, uh, and Nito, going on about culture this, not examining culture. I examine culture in depth. I mean, I've lived in Asian cultures for several years, very, very different from Western culture, and I'll get into that in a second. But that all those cultural constraints are necessarily going to be informed by biological precedents that took billions, millions, in some cases hundreds of thousands of years to form. Particular behavioral trajectories and particular behavioral leanings that we call culture are a manifestation of different results of different causal variables which I've talked about prior you know some of you who've seen my video um, the auto on the autopilot function I talk about human behavior falling within a, a certain sphere of, of possible possible outcomes you have a certain set of variables I would argue you even have a very large set of variables but this set of variables is not infinite and 
the results themselves, of course, are not infinite, but there are many, many different combinations. And here's where I'm going to proceed on to some of the cultural manifestations of biological imperatives. So, a while back, the High Lord of Monotremes, Wong Bats, Taipans, Funnel Webs, Emus, and Poisonous Fauna in general, and a denizen of the penal colony, and a writer for Voice for Men, wrote an entire article about one statement I made about chivalry. He wrote an entire argument. I, I said that effectively, and I'm paraphrasing myself, that gynocentrism, this kind of gynocentrism has been going on forever. Chivalry, effectively. Now, I didn't get a chance to defend myself or explain myself. He just went ahead and wrote the article. He's a very smart guy, and I'm sure he'll watch this eventually. Uh, he knows who he is. But let me explain my understanding of chivalry briefly here and understand the biological imperatives behind it. So, uh, the Lord of Monotremes, for short, is in fact right when he asserts that that particular manifestation of chivalrous behavior and attitudes towards women during the High Middle Ages, roughly beginning in the 12th century, because that's when we can we, we see the first manifest, manifestation of troubadour literature, uh, that the High Middle Ages, if you will, that is, he's right, something relatively new on the human scene in that particular manifestation. Now, Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer, the famous philosopher, whom I do plan on doing an entire video on uh, at, at length later, at a later date, because he has some very important things to say about women. But Schopenhauer, uh, in this his, his famous video, Über die Weiber, about uh, concerning women, or, you know, that uh, he postulates that this chivalrous attitude came from Christianity, and I think he might be right. But once again, you, you start with the simple building blocks. Is Christianity as a, a proximate causal explanation sufficient? Now, as far as I know, having read that article uh, by the Lord of Monotremes a while back, he doesn't postulate a cause. I will postulate a cause for the... <laughs> somewhat effulgent, exuberant manifestation of chivalry that began in the High Middle Ages. And I will, of course, mention Christianity. I do believe that Schopenhauer is probably right about this and how we ended up in the present situation. Now, this kind of chivalrous behavior on this scale had not been known in the West prior. However, there had been smaller manifestations. Uh, in, in, the, in Roman times, in times of dearth and war, when supplies were uh, in short, uh, where things were in short supply, when uh, when the state had to save essentially, there were several occasions where noble women, particularly noble women, would complain about not having access to their various luxuries. You see, the beginning of this is understanding not that human beings or men have always been chivalrous in the medievalist uh, sense of chivalry, but men undoubtedly always had a preference for favoring the female over themselves, over other males. And this has been talked about ad nauseum. I mean, this is, uh, this is the limiting factor in reproduction. In primitive societies, Women are kept as safe as possible with lots of restrictions put on their freedom for that purpose because this is a, like a precious a precious gem. We don't want to damage the gem. So keep it, keep it under wrap, keep it under protection at any cost. This is the, the basic biological uh, backing or the basic biological background behind this. Now, now... Chivalry, partly, is a manifestation of that. Now, in the High Middle Ages, we have the development of, uh, of fiefdoms, of a, of a legitimate landed nobility of a very different sort to the sort uh, the Romans. The Romans had landed nobility as well, but it was, it was a much, much a different system. And uh, in the High Middle Ages, th these guys and women, men and women, were just living a cut above the rest. 
And notice how chivalry of this sort was only popular amongst the landed nobility. The chivalry the of the, the sort, the majority of the troubadour of sort, described in literature were and practice, uh, the women were not enjoying this is part the of my theory. Of, uh, male chivalrous almost people. certainly comes from the fact that when things get really comfortable in a certain class of society or echelon of society, women start wanting more and more, and men are always are willing. That's what I meant by this has been going on forever to accommodate that need. Like I said, only the landed nobility had access, or landed female nobility had access to this kind of privilege. This is what happens. Now, there's another reason for this, and I, I think Schopenhauer is correct. Now, in looking at Christianity, you have this reverence for virginity. The Virgin Mary is essentially essentially a deity in her own right. I mean, Catholicism in particular has, has so many saints that effectively it's a, it's a polytheistic religion in larger measure. But yes, she is effectively a, a deity in her own right, the Virgin Mary. And what's important to ask here is, for example, the part of chivalry is the reverence of the pure, the pure female. And that, of course, is a concept uh, in large measure derived from, from Christian idealism. But reverence of, 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 of the pure and unsullied virgin, you find that across cultures, across the globe. And there's a simple reason for that. Once again, going back to the basic building blocks of life, a virgin, a female, who's a young female, who's not had sex yet, means... That implies, especially to men, particularly to men, exclusively to men, that she is a prime candidate for uh, copulation and reproduction, and that no other man, he'll, he'll, he won't have to compete with, potentially with another man. She's been unsullied. No other man has uh, added his DNA collection to her, as it were. And I think at the end of the day, that's a very simple but powerful explanation for why virgin culture, if you will, has so much reverence, not just in Christianity, but really across cultures, no matter, of course there are a few exceptions, but in the vast majority, and certainly in Eastern Asia, very, very important, particularly in Confucianist culture, which I'll get to in a bit. Very simple, the, the unsullied virgin is the perfect receptacle for male DNA material. The, the, the woman who's had sex with multiple partners, on the other hand, is, uh, well, multiple men potentially. He might be competing against multiple men and so on and so forth. So, I mean, going, yes, Christianity, yes, but why is there a reference, a, a, a sense of, of awe for virginity, for this, the Virgin Mary, for whatever deity or figurehead Godhead, they just they decide to insert there. Take your pick. Uh, that's where that probably comes from. Now, if you combine that with women in, living in a relatively speaking the Middle Ages, even the High Middle Ages, which is not certainly implication indication that there's anything high about them. Uh, it's more a temporal classification than anything else. Uh, as far as one could back then, roughly 900, 800 years ago, they were living pretty well compared to the peasantry, certainly. And when things get really comfortable, that's when women start acting up, if you will. That's when women start wanting more and wanting to be treated special because the restrictions that are normally placed on the precious gem the reproductive vessel, the limiting factor in reproduction, that are probably absolutely necessary in a survivalist environment, become loosened. Those restrictions become loosened because it's, well, no longer necessary. The land of nobility for the time had access to everything it wanted, abundant food, resources. Um, they were, they were the king certainly was paid tithes and so on and so forth. So th that, in combination with a reverence of, of the pure, i.e. The, the, the virginal, explains fairly readily, and I can't offer definitive proof, but I'm trying to use the simple building blocks of biology and explain this, 
uh, rather readily explains how chivalry came uh, came about. Now, and as time goes on, things become more and more comfortable. And I'll get to that in a bit. So I've been talking about different variables and different possibilities. So let's move on to a place like South Korea, which, as I said, is the country I'm most familiar with in Eastern Asia. Arguably still the most conservative because it still practices a form of Confucianism, neo-Confucianism. And there are some significant distinctions between traditional older forms of Confucianism practiced in China thousands of years ago and modern neo-Confucianist uh, South Korea. But for the purposes of this discussion, I'll simply refer to it as Confucianism. Now, Confucianism, as manifests in South Korea, is an incredibly rigid system, hierarchical, uh, Everything's about respect to the elders. And that it stands in stark contrast to developments in the West, which has tended to be always far more individualistic. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that here we have an example of, of, of culture undermining biology or culture taking precedence over biological functions. <clears throat> far from it. This is... A classic example of what I've been talking about, where you have any given set of variables, one possible behavioral outcome is a more individualistic outlook, as how we've ended up in the West, and a less individualistic, collectivistic outlook, and believe me, Confucianism is pure collectivism, uh, as we see in, uh, in Eastern Asia. And mind you, Confucian, Lao Tzu in Chinese, I believe, he, he was not, uh, well, Apart from Marx and Marx and Hegel and Engels using their time machine to get to him too in China, they, they got everywhere basically. Apart from that, he was <laughs> relatively free, uh, relatively free of their influence. And let me tell you, you don't get much more collectivist than than Confucianism, neo uh, neo or otherwise. It's all about obedience to the parents, the elders. Uh, and this is codified, as I've said a few times, in the lang Korean language itself. There are at least at least seven different means of speaking to people depending on their station in life. Now, yeah, that's a very different culture to, say, American culture. Uh, often, language language is, is a biological phenomenon, but it, it does have cultural manifestations. Uh, I see this personally, this, this, this move towards a much more individual perspective, which is really above all been uh, encapsulated in, in Anglo-Saxon culture with the loss of polite forms in language, for example. In modern English, uh, up until roughly the beginning of the 18th century, uh, which would be early modern English, just it still had polite forms between you and thou. Thou is, in fact, an impolite form. It's a familiar form. And you still have this with... Uh, uh, in Spanish and French, tu, vous, uh, sie in German, du, and so on and so forth. And you have that in in Korean as well, uh, but far, far much more extensive. And that's, of course, a reflection, a cultural reflection of the, uh, the collectivist uh, nature of Confucianism. These used to exist in Chinese as well. They've long since disappeared. And of course, they exist in Japanese just as extensively as they do, honorifics as they're called, uh, in, in Korean. And the depth of this is such that there, these particles are attached to every word. This is not simply a pronoun like in Western languages, but they're attached to literally every word. And so depending on whom you're talking to, you will, uh, you will use a different... Uh, essentially particle, polite, politeness particle, I mean, honorific particle, to describe that. So, for example, if you could, yogi, yogi means here in, South, in Korean, but that's that's pretty impolite. Yogi-yo, yogi-yo, yogi-yo is kind of a middle politeness. And so you, if, maybe if you don't, you don't really know someone that well, but they're not that old, then you might want to use that. So there are all these degrees. Now, Conversely, uh, modern English has, has nothing of the sort. I mean, you covers both the singular and the plural, and we don't ever really talk. We, we have no way of distinguishing familiar and unfamiliar, and you can see this manifest in the culture. You can see this manifested in, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, uh, you know, going, if you ever, well, most of you are American, you know, the stupid question, I, it irritates me no end. You're standing in a, in, a, in a queue in the supermarket, and they, how you doing? 
they're asking me a deeply important existential question and they say how you're doing well I uh, these days I either ignore it or I actually answer the question they're always shocked but this is the distinction I'm just trying to draw the distinction so yeah the West has taken a much more individualistic turn here and in, like I said these are just different outcomes to to different sets of variables but they're all human variables now why for example would a society like Korean society develop a extremely strict collectivist mindset could it be that life had been quite difficult for a long long time and the social cohesion provided by a Confucianist collectivist system facilitated overall survival of the group and society in general far better than a more individualistic perspective? Could it be that? I think it's the case. And we also see in South Korean culture how uh, as things become much more comfortable, and South Korea is arguably the most high-tech country in the world now, the fastest internet and so on and so forth, how things that you come as comfort comes to the country, as it becomes more and more wealthy, uh, as comfort grows, things, cultural things that used to be really important, such as, uh, you know, every now and then eating dog meat because it was an available source of meat. It's actually something I enjoy as well. That's becoming more and more taboo because people are beginning to keep pets, dogs. Why are they keeping dogs? Because they can afford it, you see? Mechanization effect. So to say, so the culture is really important, but this is just a, a different reaction, a somewhat different reaction to a set of variables. Environmental, they're always environmental variables. The environment is the number one shape limit, uh, factor, what genes are, and then the environment, genes and the environment in uh, the development of an individual or a mass of individuals. So the East went that way, the West went a different way. <clears throat> Let's move back to the West. Now, talking about the great three-headed Satan, Marx, Hegel, and Engels, in any whatever order they want to put that in, in understanding things, not just asserting I knowing, what was it about their particular political ideology that was so appealing to women, and why? <laughs> When the Industrial Revolution was really gaining steam and taking it off, why was it even more appealing at that point in time? What really hit the nail on the head for those, those cultural Marxists? Well, life was becoming ever more comfortable. And going back to what I was saying before about the land of nobility during the Middle Ages, it was comfortable for them too, relatively speaking. And at no point in time uh, in, the, in human history up until the 19th century, I mean, it had been more comfortable. The, the, the developments, locomotives, then automobiles in the early 20th century, and so on and so forth. I've talked about this at length, of course, but this mechanization effect, which facilitates an easier, more comfortable way of living. And once women get access to that, they, their restrictions are loosened. People become less concerned. They're not living out in the outback in, in a survivalist environment. They're living in a relatively comfortable environment and move forward becomes even more comfortable, ever more comfortable. That's the one aspect, the mechanization effect. Then you have government largesse offering them benefits in, term, uh, in exchange for, for votes uh, to keep politicians, uh, we've, this has been talked about extensively by Barbarossa, the politicians effectively having sex with women, uh, but the sex for him is the vote. And uh, the resources he's providing is government largesse, which is um, usually taken in the form of, uh, of tax money. Combine the mechanization effect and women's natural inclination to be more collectivist, to seek provision at all costs, that is what's so appealing about the cultural Marxist feminist blah, 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 blah. But you see, there's nothing in particular about cultural Marxism that isn't because you could just change the name. There's nothing, I mean, you could call it anything you wanted to. Anything and any force, any ideology, any, any philosophy that taps into innate female desires and fears will be just as successful. And you can take that to the bank. 
any philosophy, any political ideology that taps into basic female nature will be just as successful. And the more comfortable things become, the more disastrous it becomes. I mean, look at the current state of affairs in the West now, quite frankly. That's that's what we have. I mean, women are just running a rough shot over men. They're doing whatever the hell they want. They're divorcing on a whim. Uh, child support, and the list is endless. The false rape, the list is endless and endless. It just goes on and on. But it, never before have, have people been this comfortable. Now, mind you, the economy is a total fucking wreck. It's a train wreck. We're driving off a cliff. But ostensibly, environmentally speaking, we're pretty damn comfortable. So, women are behaving in accordance with that comfort. That's how chivalry was facilitated. And then that's why this attitude still exists. It's, it's still, We've never been at such a point in time in history where all people uh, can live in this level of comfort, have access to all this education, and so on and so forth. But once again, this taps into basic biological building blocks that we have, biological drives and urges and instincts. It's simply not possible to say uh, culture, culture can mitigate biological urges. Arguably, the extreme collectivist Confucianist model of South Korea, which is even more conservative than Japan, if you can believe that, uh, is is probably so extreme that it, 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 well, I know for a fact, it literally crushes other biological urges for individual expression. Now, this is not a, a case of culture superseding biology, but simply mitigating it for the sake of the collective. And once again, we have this long, long, I mean, it's, it, we, it's, we as human beings can't even reckon the time, but this, this unbroken chain of biological imperatives that have, have been in place for every species on Earth, including human beings. To say that, that culture simply exists, they, I've been accused of looking at biology in a vacuum. No, I don't. I see the interaction between it. I see precedence. This is what is meant by biology precedes culture and political ideology. There will not ever be a single, there will never be a single political ideology devised that does not facilitate or appeal to some aspect of human biology that either amplifies it, minimizes it, diminishes it, uh, mixes it. That's how. That's how. How certainly in terms of social thought, social thought works, and how social thought is then uh, formed into political ideologies. The particulars of of cultural Marxism are are only interesting because of how it appeals to the female in the case of feminism. Yeah. And, and mind you, once again, the time period, it happened when things were getting really comfortable for human beings at large, particularly in the West. And with the mechanization effect, we see this spreading across the globe. One by one, women dropping their traditional roles because the environment is no longer survivalist. The environment is friendlier, it's easier, they can earn their own money, and so on and so forth. We see it all falling apart. And governments, particularly in the West, offering incentives to women. So that's what's meant by uh, biological precedence. And it's simply undeniable this the, the the billions of years literally where basically life was single celled more or less and then the hundreds of millions of years where we didn't see a single mammal and then the even further st stretch of time from the beginning to the, the appearance of hominids and apes such as ourselves i mean to think that ha that, that is not the principle and and the fact that we're here i'm here is the testament because all of our ancestors followed basic principles of biological imperatives and culture only exists as a mitigating force it will be informed by biology it cannot and will not supersede it now you might argue you might argue now that oh well 
people don't want to have children. They have sex and take the pill. That's not superseding biology. The desire for sex is the desire for reproduction isn't conscious. That's the manifestation. That the sexual desire is the manifestation to 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 reproduce. Now, if you were to somehow achieve nil sexual desire, which very few of us have, then you can argue, yeah, I, you know, I've superseded biology, but you might want to get your hormones checked as well. So a bit of a rant, but a, a bit of complex topic. I did want to go into some depth on this, and I once again appreciate the Lord of Fjords affording me the liberty to upload at will on his channel. I hope this clarifies some things finally a lot of its repetition some of it's a bit new but uh, it's just incredible how people do not view themselves as as biological organisms i mean I, when i walk about i look at everything in that in those terms uh when i eat i i this is how i i, I live I, I look at the macronutrients i look at the, the calories i look at uh, this is a, everything for me is just a question of of, 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 of understanding things on, on their most basic level. You know, uh, in my workouts, most people do splits in the gym. I fucking hate splits. What am I doing now? I'm doing something completely different. Basically just doing four exercises, front squats, dips, uh, pull-ups with a sup uh, supinated grip that is an under uh, arms turned around, and, and deadlifts, and, and some uh, basic things for abs and calves to round it off, and then farmer's walk. Most people, I never see people do that stuff at the gym. Well, I, I understand that compound exercises, particularly if you're not juicy and you don't have amazing genetics, are far more beneficial uh, than these stupid things like cable crossovers or whatever. And I don't want to go off on a rap. The point is, I, I'm constantly trying to understand the basis of things, the basis of exercise, of anatomy. Understanding is more important than knowledge ultimately, but not you need knowledge to to then move to that step of understanding. Anyway, I, I, this is going off on a tangent. I didn't want to go off on a tangent. So once again, thanks to the Lord of Fjords MGTOW database. And uh, yeah, like I said, I think in a future spontaneous long rant such as this will be posted on his channel. Longer, more scripted ones will be posted on That Cynical Cynicism, the Lord of Northumbria. Until then, thanks for watching and take care. May the gods watch over you.